we are acting for the everyday person who, in terms of the law, is an underdog because the law is complex and difficult and it's expensive to engage with it. There are funding mechanisms that enable us to help them. Our opponents are the most powerful in the land. We're talking about the government or the police or big corporations like GlaxoSmithKline, one of the biggest drug companies in the world, uh, or insurance companies. Some of the insurance companies are some of the biggest and most well-funded in the world. Now remember, all of those powerful opponents have unlimited uh, access to lawyers and funds. There is no step that they can't take because they can't afford it. They will always have the best lawyers. And so if you didn't have a firm like us to help the underdog, there is almost no way that an ordinary person could succeed. If they go into court on their own, without the evidence, not knowing the law and not knowing the procedure, there's almost no way you can succeed. So it's our work, using the funding mechanisms which are at our disposal, which enables the ordinary person to level the playing field and combat the most powerful in the land. The continuation of our work requires the continuation of some effective funding mechanism, such as legal aid or no-win-no-fee agreements. Both of those funding mechanisms are currently under threat, and it seems to me almost a del deliberate tactic by the government to make it more difficult for people to bring cases by taking away these funding mechanisms or by increasing court fees and uh, other mechanisms. And so this is really an attack uh, on ordinary people and their ability to get uh, justice through our justice system. But we're here fighting on their behalf, so far as we can, to make sure that, that, that their cases can continue and that these changes are rolled back. I hope that one day, in the not-too-distant future, the legal aid scheme will be properly reinstated so that everybody does have access to a lawyer and that nobody is prevented from going to court just because they are too poor. In many cases where there's been a tragic loss of life and the question arises as to whether the death could be avoided, in those cases you tend to have an inquest. And that is a public hearing in front of a coroner uh, who controls the proceedings and calls witnesses uh, and tries to get to the facts of the case to work out what happened and uh, what went wrong and uh, whether there are any recommendations to prevent something like this happening again. Uh, in the military cases we've been doing, the Human Rights Act sometimes arises. And the, the Human Rights Act has come into English law relatively recently. It doesn't change the fundamental law because the United Kingdom was a signatory to the original European Convention on Human Rights, which was signed uh, after the Second World War, and we helped to draft it. And it, it, it sets down certain basic rights which every state has to comply with, such as the right to life, uh, the right to a fair trial, the right not to be tortured. Uh, now, the Human Rights Act made a difference because until it was passed, you had to go through the English courts and then get to Strasbourg, to the European court, to enforce your rights. But the Human Rights Act short-circuited that and it introduced the application of the human rights into the English courts so that you didn't have to go to Strasbourg. That made it much quicker and it meant that every case that's determined in the English courts now has to have regard to and comply with the European Convention on Human Rights. One of the differences that that made was to inquest procedure. So where there is an inquest which involves a death and the state has played some part, or the state's agencies, then the Article 2 right to life comes into play. And the courts have decided that you need something that's called an Article 2 inquest, which is a much wider inquiry than a normal inquest. And it takes longer and a lot more questions are 
asked because the, the coroner wants to get to see whether uh, the state has had some part to play in that loss of life. So Article 2 inquests uh, frequently happen where there are deaths in the military. And so we've had a lot of experience of that. And in uh, the Jason Smith case, there was an Article 2 inquest. Uh, but the Minister of Defence was trying to argue that the Human Rights Act didn't apply because the death took place abroad outside of a military camp. And that was one of the big arguments in the case, is did the Human Rights Act apply to this case, and if so, should there be an Article 2 inquest? Eventually, uh, there was an Article 2 inquest, but the arguments about the application of the Human Rights Act to these events is still going on uh, and hasn't been resolved even by our, our own Supreme Court. So it's a highly controversial area of law, and the present government, in the light of that case and others like it, is actually considering that it wants to scrap the Human Rights Act and prevent these cases being brought in the future. However, from our point of view, the Human Rights Act has been incredibly useful uh, in enabling uh, our clients to assert their rights and in particular to get questions answered in difficult fatal cases. These may involve deaths in custody, uh, in uh, police stations, in police cells, in prison... In, in mental hospitals or death in hospitals generally because we have the NHS, the Human Rights Act will apply. Uh, and obviously uh, deaths uh, in the services where the state will certainly be involved. What we have to do is to try at all times to understand uh, what our clients are going through. It's, it's impossible to put ourselves completely in their place, but we need to understand that they've been through some terrible loss or trauma. Uh, and then we have to uh, patiently explain uh, what it is that the law can do uh, to make things better. So it, it can't make the person better or bring the person back, but it can make a big difference in lots of other ways. So we explain the procedure and then we lead them through the procedure. We're constantly giving advice to our clients to explain where the case is going and what we can achieve. So we're trying to manage their expectations, uh, to show them what we can and what we can't achieve. Uh, and then hopefully when we get to the end of it, and if we've managed their expectations, they can see uh, the victory for what it is. Uh, and uh, obviously we hope that they will be uh, pleased with the outcome if we achieve what we set out to achieve, uh, then we will have the satisfaction of knowing that we got that case right, we'll close that file and we'll move on to the next one. Remember that at any one time our lawyers may be dealing with 50 or 60 cases like this, so um, we, you know, we are constantly approaching uh, settlement negotiations uh, and um, it is very satisfying when you get the right result.